Hey, what's up, guys? It's Morn here, and today I have the Red Pyramid for you guys again. I'm gonna start on chapter three because I believe it's where we left off. Uh, yeah. You guys ready? Let's begin. Okay, and I apologize for my hair. That was a mess. Everything. Yeah, it'll be bright. Yeah. I'll keep the lighting up there on now. All right. <clears throat> Uh, let me find chapter three. Real quick. Okay. Imprisoned with my cat. Um. Yeah. Imprisoned with my cat. Give me the bloody mic. Hello, Sadie here. My brother's a rubbish storyteller. Sorry about that, but now you've got me, so all is well. Let's see. Um, the explosion, Rosetta Stone in a billion pieces. Fiery evil bloke. Dad box in the, boxed up in a coffin. Creepy Frenchman and Arab girl with a knife. Us passing out. Right. Okay. So when I woke up, the police were rushing about as you might expect. They separated me from my brother. I didn't really mind that part. Wait. He's, pain, he's a pain anyway. But they locked me in the curator's office for ages. And yes, they used our bicycle chain to do it. Cretins. I was shattered, of course. I just been knocked out by a fiery whatever it was. I'd watched my dad get packed in a sarcophagus and shot through the floor. I tried to tell the police all about that, but did they care? No. Worst of all, I had a lingering chill, as if someone was pushing ice cold needles into the back of my neck. It had started when I looked at those blue glowing words. Dad had drawn on the Rosetta Stone, and I knew what they meant. A family disease, perhaps? Can knowledge of boring Egyptian stuff be hereditary? with my luck. Long after my gum had gone stale, a policewoman finally retrieved me from the curator's office. She asked me no questions. She just trundled me into a police car and took me home. Even then, I wasn't allowed to explain to Grant and Grant. The policewoman just tossed me into my room, and I waited and waited. I don't like waiting. I paced the floor. My room was nothing posh, just an attic space with a window and a bed and a desk. There wasn't much to do. Muffin sniffed my leg, and her tail puffed up like a bottle brush. I suppose she doesn't fancy the smell of museum. She hissed and disappeared under the bed. Thanks a lot, I muttered. I opened the door, but the policewoman was standing guard. The inspector will be with you in a moment, she told me. Please stay inside. I could, set, I could see downstairs, just a glimpse of Gramps pacing the room, wringing his hands while Carter and a police inspector talked on the sofa. I couldn't make out what they were saying. Did I just use the loo? I asked the nice officer. No. She closed the door in my face, as if I might rig an explosion in the toilet. Honestly. I dug out my iPod and scrolled through my playlist. Nothing struck me. I threw it on my bed in disgust. When I'm too distracted for music, that is a very sad thing. I wondered why Carter got to talk to the police first. It wasn't fair. I fiddled with the necklace that had given me. I'd never been sure what the symbol meant. Carter's was obviously an eye, but mine looked like a bit of an angel or perhaps a killer alien robot. <laughs> Why on earth had Dad asked if I still had it? Of course I still had it. It was the only gift he'd ever given me. Well, apart from Muffin, and with that, cat that cat's attitude, I'm not sure I'd call her a proper gift. Dad had practically abandoned me at age six, after all. The necklace was my one link to him. On good days, I would stare at it and remember him fondly. On bad days, which were much more frequent, I would fling it across the room and stomp on it and curse him for not being around, which I found quite therapeutic. But in the end, I always put it back on. <clears throat> at any rate, during the weirdness at the museum, and I'm not making this up, the necklace got hotter. I nearly took it off, but I couldn't help wondering if it was truly protecting me somehow. I'll make things right, Dad had said, with that guilty look he often gives me. Well, colossal fail, Dad. What had he been thinking? I wanted to believe it had all been a dream. A bad dream. The glowing hieroglyphs, the snake, staff, the coffin. Things like that simply don't happen. But I knew better. I couldn't dream anything as horrifying as a fiery man's face when he turned on us. Soon, boy, he would told Carter, as if he intended to track us down. Just the idea made my hands tremble. 
I also couldn't help wondering about our stop at Cleopatra's Needle, how that had insisted on seeing it, as if he were stealing his courage as... As if he were stealing his courage. As if what he did at the British Museum had something to do with my mom. My eyes wandered around the room and fixed on my desk. No, I thought. Not gonna do it. But I walked over and opened the drawer. I shoved aside a few old mags, my stash of sweets, a stack of math homework I'd forgotten to hand in, and a few pictures of me and my mates. Liz and Emma trying on ridiculous hats in Camden Market. And there at the bottom of it all was the picture of my mom. Granny and Gramps have loads of pictures. They keep a shrine to Ruby in the whole cupboard. Mom's childhood artwork, her O-level results, her graduation picture from university, her favorite jewelry. It's quite mental. I was determined not to be like them, living in the past. I barely remembered Mom after all, and nothing could change the fact that she was dead. But I did keep the one picture. It was of Mom and me at our house in Los Angeles, just after I was born. She stood out on the balcony, the Pacific Ocean behind her, holding a wrinkled, pudgy lump of baby that would someday grow up to be yours truly. Baby me was not much to look at, but Mum was gorgeous, even in shorts and a tattered t-shirt. Her eyes were deep blue. Her blonde hair was clipped back. Her skin was perfect. Quite depressing compared to mine. People always say I looked like her, but I couldn't even get the spot off my chin, much less look so mature and beautiful. Stop smirking, Carter. The photo fascinated me because I hardly remembered our lives together at all. But the main reason I'd kept the photo was because of the symbol on Mom's t-shirt. One of those life symbols. An onk. 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 A-N-K-H. I don't know how to spell. My dead mother wearing the symbol for life. Nothing could have been sadder. But she smiled at the camera as if she knew a secret, as if my dad and she were sharing a private joke. Something tugged at the back of my mind. That stocky man in the trench coat who'd been arguing with dad across the street. He'd, some, he'd said something about the peronk. Had he meant onk as in the symbol for life? And if so, what was a purr? I suppose he didn't mean pear as in the fruit. I had an eerie feeling that if I saw the words peronk written in hieroglyph, hieroglyphics, I would know what they meant. I put down the picture of Mum. I picked up the pencil and turned over one of my old homework papers. I wondered what would happen if I tried to draw the words peronk. Would the right design just occur to me? As I touched pencil to paper, my bedroom door opened. Miss Kane? I whirled and dropped the pencil. A police inspector stood frowning in my doorway. What are you doing? Maths, I said. My ceiling was quite low, so the inspector had to stoop to come in. He wore a lint-colored suit that matched his gray hair and his ashen face. Now then, Sadie, I'm Chief Inspector Williams. Let's have a chat, shall we? Sit down. I didn't sit, and neither did he, which must have annoyed him. It's hard to look in charge when you're hunched over like Quasimodo. <laughs> Tell me everything, please, he said, from the time your father came round to get you. I already told the police at the museum. Again, if you don't mind. So I told him everything. Why not? His left eyebrow crept higher and higher as I told him the strange bits, like the glowing letters in Serpent Staff. Well, Sadie, Inspector Williams said, you've got quite an imagination. I'm not lying, Inspector, and I think your eyebrow is trying to escape. He tried to look at his own eyebrows, then scowled. Now, Sadie, I'm sure this is very hard on you. I understand you want to protect your father's reputation. But he's gone now. You mean through the floor in a coffin, I insisted. He's not dead. Inspector Williams spread his hands. Sadie, I'm very sorry, but we must find out why he did this act of well. Act of what? He cleared his throat uncomfortably. Your father destroyed priceless artifacts and apparently killed himself in the process. We'd very much like to know why. I stared at him. Are you saying my father's a terrorist? Are you mad? We've made calls with some of your father's associates. I understand his behavior had become erratic since your mother's death. He'd become withdrawn and obsessive in his studies, spending more and more time in Egypt. He's a bloody Egyptologist. You should be looking for him, not asking stupid questions. Sadie, he said, and I could hear in his voice that he was resisting the urge to strangle me. Strangely, I get this a lot from adults. There are extremist groups in Egypt that object to Egyptian artifacts being kept in other countries' museums. 
These people might have approached your father. Perhaps in this state your father became an easy target for them. If you've heard him mention any names, I stormed past him to the window. I was so angry I could hardly think. I refused to believe Dad was dead. No. No, no. And a terrorist? Please. Why did adults have to be so thick? They always say, tell the truth. And when you do, they don't believe you. What's the point? I stared down at the dark street. Suddenly that cold, tingly feeling got worse than ever. I focused on the dead tree where I'd met Dad earlier. Sitting there now in the dim light of a tree lamp, looking up at me was the pudgy bloke in the black trench coat and the round glasses and mascara, the man Dad had called Amos. I suppose I should have felt threatened by an odd man staring up at me in the dark of night, but his expression was full of concern, was full of concern, and he looked so familiar. It was driving me mad that I couldn't remember why. Behind me, the inspector cleared his throat, stating, No one blames you for the attack on the museum. We understand you were dragged into this against your will. I turned from the window. Against my will? I chained the curator in, into his office. The inspector's eyebrows started to creep up again. Be that as it may, surely you didn't understand what your father meant to do. Possibly your brother was involved? I snorted. I snorted. Carter, please. So are you determined to protect him as well? You consider him a proper brother, do you? I couldn't believe it. I wanted to smack him in the face. What's that supposed to mean? Because he doesn't look like me? The inspector blinked. Blinked. I only meant... I know what you meant. Of course he's my brother. Inspector Williams held up his hands apologetically, but I was still seething. As much as Carter annoyed me, I hated it when people assumed we weren't related, or looked at my father at my father askance when he said the three of us were a family. Like we'd done something wrong. Stupid Dr. Martin at the museum, Inspector Williams, it happened every time Dad and Carter and, Dad and Carter and I were together. Every bloody time. I'm sorry, Sadie, the inspector said. I only wanted I only want to make sure we separate the innocent from the guilty. It will go much easier for everyone if you cooperate. Any information, anything your father said, people he might have mentioned? Almost, I blurted out just to see the reaction. He met a, ma a man named Almost. Inspector Williams sighed. Sadie, he couldn't have done. Surely you know that. We spoke with Almost not one hour ago on the phone from his home in New York. He isn't in New York, I insisted. He's right. I glanced out the window and Almost was gone. Bloody typical. That's not possible, I said. Exactly, the inspector said. But he was here, I exclaimed. Who is he? One of Dad's colleagues? How did you know to call him? Really, Sadie, this acting must stop. Acting? The inspector studied me for a moment, then set his jaw as if he'd made a decision. We've already had the truth from Carter. I didn't want to upset you, but he told us everything. He understands there's no point protecting your father now. You might as well help us, and there will be no charges against you. You shouldn't lie to children, I yelled, hoping my voice carried all the way downstairs. Carter would never say a word against Dad, and neither will I. The inspector didn't even have the decency to look embarrassed. He crossed his arms. I'm sorry you feel that way, Sadie. I'm afraid it's time we went downstairs to discuss consequences with your grandparents. Chapter 4 Kidnapped by a Not-So-Stranger I just love family meetings, very cozy with the Christmas garlands around the fireplace, and a nice pot of tea and a detective from Scotland Yard ready to arrest you. Carter slumped on the sofa, cult cr yeah, cradling Dad's work bag. I wondered why the police had let him keep it. It should have been evidence or something, but the inspector didn't seem to notice it at all. Carter looked awful. I mean, even pro even worse than usual. Honestly, the boy had never been in a proper school, and he dressed like a junior professor with his khaki trousers and a button-down shirt and loafers. He's not bad-looking, I suppose. He's reasonably tall and fit, and his hair isn't hopeless. He's got Dad's eyes, and my mates Liz and Emma have even told me from his picture that he's hot, which I must take with a grain of salt because A, he's my brother, and B, my mates are a bit crazed. When it came to clothes, Carter wouldn't have known hot if it bit him on the bum. Oh, don't look at me like that, Carter. You know it's true. At any rate, I shouldn't have been too hard on him. He was taking Dad's disappearance even worse than I was. Grant and Gramps sat on either side of him, looking quite nervous. The pot of tea and a plate of biscuits sat on the table, but no one was having any. Chief Inspector Williams ordered me into the only free chair. 
Then he paced in front of the fireplace importantly. Two more police stood by the front door, the woman from earlier, and a big bloke who kept eyeing the biscuits. Mr. and Miss Foss, Inspector Williams said, I'm afraid we have two uncooperative children. Graham fidgeted with the trim of her dress. It's hard to believe she's related to Mum. Graham is frail and colorless, like a sick person, really. While Mum in the photos always looked so happy and full of life. They're just children, she managed. Surely you can't blame them. Pa, Grant said. This is ridiculous, Inspector. They aren't responsible. Gramps is a former rugby player. He has beefy arms, a belly, much too big for a shirt, and eyes sunk deep in his face, as if someone had punched them. Well, actually, Dad had punched them years ago, but that's another story. Usually, people will get out of his way, but Inspector Williams didn't seem impressed. Mr. Foss, he said, what do you imagine the morning headlines will read? British Museum attacked. Rosetta Stone destroyed. Your son-in-law, former son-in-law, Gramps corrected was most likely vaporized in the explosion, or he ran off. In which case, he didn't run off, I shouted. We need to know where he is, the inspector continued. And the only witnesses, your grandchildren, refused to tell me the truth. We did tell you the truth, Carter said. That isn't dead. He sank through the floors. Inspector Williams glanced at Gramps as if to say, There, you see? Then he turned to Carter. Young man, your father has been, has committed a criminal act. He's left you behind to deal with the consequences. That's not true, I snapped, my voice trembling with rage. I couldn't believe Dad would intentionally leave us to the mercy of the police, of course. But the idea of him abandoning me, well, as I might have mentioned, that's a bit of a sore point. Dear, please, Graham told me, the inspector is only doing his job. Badly, I said. Let's all have some tea, Graham suggested. No, Carter and I yelled at once, which made me feel bad for Graham, as she practically wilted into the sofa. We can charge you, the inspector warned, turning on me. We can and we will. He froze. Then he blinked several times as if he'd forgotten what he was doing. Gramps frowned. Er, inspector? Yes? In Chief Inspector Williams murmured dreamily. He reached in his pocket. He reached in his pocket and took out a little blue booklet, an American passport. He threw it in Carter's lap. You're being deported, the inspector announced. You're going to leave the country within 24 hours. If we need to question you further, you'll be contacted through the FBI. Carter's mouth fell open. He looked at me, and I knew I wasn't imagining how odd this was. The inspector had completely changed direction. He'd been about to arrest us, I was sure of it, and then out of the blue, he was deporting Carter? Even the other police, officer look, police officers looked confused. Sir, the policewoman asked, are you sure? Quiet, Lindley, the two of you may go. The cops hesitated until Williams made a shooing motion with his hand. Then they left, closing the door behind them. Hold on, Carter said. My father has disappeared and you want me to leave the country? Your father your father is either dead or a fugitive son, the inspector said. Deportation is the kindest option. It's already been arranged. With whom? Gramps demanded. Who authorized this? With the inspector got that funny blank look again. With the proper authorities. Believe me, it's better than prison. Carter looked too devastated to speak, but before I could feel sorry for him, Inspector Williams turned to me. You too, miss. He might as well have hit me with a sledgehammer. You're deporting me? I asked. I live here. I live here. You're an, Amer sorry. You're an American citizen, and under the circumstances, it's best for you to return home. I just stared at him. I couldn't remember any home except this flat. My mates at school, my room, everything I knew here. Where am I supposed to go? Inspector, Graham said, her voice trembling. This isn't fair. I can't believe. I'll give you some time to say goodbye, the inspector interrupted. Then he frowned as if baffled by his own actions. I, I must be going. This made no sense, and the inspector seemed to realize it, but he walked to the front door anyway. When he opened it, I almost jumped out of my chair because the man in black, almost, was standing there. He'd lost his trench coat and hat somewhere, but was still wearing the same pinstripe suit and round glasses. His braided hair glittered with gold beads. I thought the inspector would say something or express surprise, but he didn't even acknowledge almost. He walked right past them and into the night. Almost came inside and closed the door. Grant and Gramps stood up. You, Gramps growled. I should have known. If I was younger, I would beat you to a pulp. Hello, Mr. and Miss Foss. Almost said he looked at Carter to, and me as if we were problems to be solved. It's time we had a talk. Yeah.
thin on the pages that say, almost made himself right at home. He flopped onto the sofa and poured himself tea. He munched on a biscuit, which was quite dangerous because Graham's biscuits are horrid. I thought Grant's head would explode. His face went bright red. He came up behind Almost and raised his hand as if we were, he were about to smack him. But Almost kept munching his biscuit. Please sit down, he told us, and we all sat. It was the strangest thing, as if we'd been waiting for the, his order. Even Grant dropped his hand and moved around to the sofa. He sat next to Almost with a disgusted sigh. Almost sipped his tea and regarded me with the same displeasure. That wasn't fair, I thought. I didn't look that bad, considering what we'd been through. Then he looked at Carter and grunted. Terrible timing, he muttered, but there's no other way. They'll have to come with me. Excuse me, I said. I'm not going anywhere with some strange man with biscuit on his face. He did not He did in fact have biscuit crumbs on his face, but he apparently didn't care as he didn't bother to check. I'm no stranger, Sadie, he said. Don't you remember? It was creepy hearing him talk to me in such a familiar way. I felt I should know him. I looked at Carter, but he seemed just as mystified as I was. No, almost, Graham said, trembling. You can't take Sadie. We had an agreement. Julius broke that agreement tonight, almost said. You know you can't care for Sadie anymore, not after what's happened. Their only choice is to, their only chance is to come with me. Why should we come why should we go anywhere with you? Carter asked. You almost got in a fight with Dad. Almost, almost looked at the work bag in Carter's lap. I see wait, I see you kept your father's bag. That's good. You'll need it. I was forgetting in the fights, Julius, and I did that quite a lot. If you didn't notice, Carter, I was trying to stop him from doing something rash. If he'd listened to me, we wouldn't be in this situation. I had no idea what he was on about, but Gramps apparently understood. You and your superstitions, he said. I told you we want none of it. Almost pointed to the black pat to the back patio. Through the glass doors you could see the light shining on the thing on the thing. It was quite a nice view when you couldn't notice how ro how run down some of the buildings were. Sorry. Superstition, is it? Almost asked. And yet you found a place to live on the east bank of the river. Gramps turned even redder. That was Ruby that was Ruby's idea. Thought it would protect us, but she was wrong about many things, wasn't she? She trusted Julius and you for one. Almost looked unfazed. He smelled interesting, like old timey spices, copal and amber, like the incense shop in Covent Garden. He finished his tea and looked straight at Graham. Miss Foss, you know what's begun. The police are the least of your worries. Graham swallowed. You you changed that inspector's mind. You made him deport Sadie. It was that or see the children arrested, almost said. Hang on, I said. You changed Inspector Williams' mind? How? Almost said, it's not permanent. Arm almost shrugged. It's not permanent. In fact, we should get to New York in the next hour or so before Inspector Williams begins to wonder why he let you go. Carter laughed incredulously. You can't get to New York from London in an hour. Not even the fastest plane. No, almost agreed. Not a plane. He turned back to Grant as if everything had been settled. Miss Foss, Carter and Sadie have only one safe option. You know that. They'll come to the mansion in Brooklyn. I can protect them there. You've got a mansion, Carl said, in Brooklyn. Almost gave me an amused, gave him an amused smile. The family mansion, you'll be safe there. But our dad is beyond your help for now, Almost said sadly. I'm sorry, Carter, I'll explain later, but Julius would want you to be safe. For that, we must move quickly. I'm afraid I'm all you've got. That was a bit harsh, I thought. Carter glanced at Grant and Gramps, then he nodded glumly. He knew that they didn't want him around, He'd always reminded them of our dad, and yes, it was stupid. It was a stupid reason not to take in your grandpa your grandson, but there you are. Well, Carter can do what he wants, I said, but I live here, and I'm not going off with some stranger, am I? I looked at Grant for support, but she was staring at the lace doilies on the table as if they were suddenly quite interesting. Gramps, surely, but he wouldn't meet my eyes either. He turned to Amos. You can get them out of the country? Hang on, I protested. Almost stood and wiped the crumbs off his jacket. He walked to the patio doors and stared out at the river. The police will be back soon. Tell them anything you like. They won't find us. You're going to kidnap us? I asked, stunned. I looked at Carter. Do you believe this? Carter shouldered his, the work bag. Then he stood like he was ready to go. Possibly he just wanted to be out of Grant and Gramps' flat. How do you plan to get to New York in an hour? He asked Almost. You said not a plane. No, Almost agreed. 
He put his finger to the window and traced something in the condensation, another bloody hieroglyph. A boat, I said, then realized I, trans I translated out loud, which I wasn't supposed to be able to do. Almost peered at me over the top of his round glass. How did you... I mean, that last, the, that last bit looks like a boat, I blurted out, but that can't be what you mean. That's ridiculous. Look, Carter cried. I pressed in next to him at the patio doors. Down at the quay side, a boat was docked, but not a regular boat, mind you. It was an Egyptian reed boat with two torches burning in the front and a big rudder in the back. A figure in a black trench coat and hat, possibly Amos, Amos's, stood at the tiller. I'll admit, for once, I was at a loss for words. We're going in that, Carter said, to Brooklyn. We'd better get started, Amos said. I'll whirl back to my grandmother. Grand, please. She brushed a tear from her cheek. It's for the best, my dear. You should take muffins. Ah, uh, yes, Amo said. We can't forget the cat. He turned towards the stairs. As if on cue, Muffin raced down in a leopard-spotted streak and leaped into my arms. She never does that. Who are you? I asked Amo. It was clear I was running out of options, but I at least wanted answers. We can't just go off with some stranger. I'm not a stranger, Amo smiled at me. I'm family. And suddenly I remembered his face, smiling down at me, saying, Happy birthday, Sadie. A memory so distant, I'd almost forgotten. Uncle Amo? I asked Hazel. That's right, Sadie, he said. I'm Julius's brother. Now come along. We have a long way to go. All right, that is chapter... Those were chapters three through four um, of The Red Pyramid by Rick Riordan. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Make sure to leave a lot. Make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. And if you haven't, check out um, chapter one and chapter two, which are on two different videos. And I will be uploading another one of these soon, shortly. Also, I found the other book, so I'll be doing another one of those soon. Um, Morpheus Rose, but yeah. Alright, well like I said, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Make sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe to my channel, and have a nice day.